Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Banana Data Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Corey Strassman. I am a community manager here at Data IQ, and I am here for the laughs. Hey, everyone. I'm Christopher Peter Macris, the lead data scientist here at Data IQ, and I'm also here for the laughs. And CPM, do you think everyone can keep a secret? Yeah, of course. I don't know that much about data science, so hopefully <laughs> you'll be able to help carry this. Oh my God. Well, Corey, I think you know a lot more than you think you know about data science, but in case we can need any technical details, I'll be there for you. Thank you. So uh, if you're new to this podcast, we just launched season five. This is the second episode. So if you missed the first episode, want to listen and like what you hear, be sure to subscribe to the Banana Data Podcast. You can listen to all of our seasons uh, and you can subscribe anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, uh, previously, on, on the first episode of season five, we spoke about uh, humanizing data. CPM, you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so last episode, uh, we walked through some concrete examples of how data insights can be humanized in an easily digestible manner. And we touched upon data visualization as an example of incorporating empathy into storytelling and relating that to um, any, any, any individual who views that uh, visualization. But why do we need the humanization of data? Who is this helping? <laughs> well, that, that's a really great question. Um, so it's helping everybody. You know, um, If you have a story to tell and you tell it in, uh, in a way that your listener does not understand, then you know your point is moot. It's not being communicated, um, and some of this data visualization and humanizing data through that visualization was very helpful and impactful in establishing that sort of emotional connection. CPM, I understand that there is a story you want to tell with a recent example of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I really, uh, really saw a very impactful and vi uh, visual very recently called "Weeks of My Life." Um, it was a very simple visualization of just squares on a board. And each square represented a different week in a life. And uh, on the board were enough squares to fill up 100 years. And uh, the idea is that you fill in these squares for every week that you've lived so far. And you can visually see, you know, unfortunately, life for each of us is going to be finite. Um, so what are we going to do about that? Well, um, to me, that, that could be a little bit morbid. But it was at the same time very motivating. Um, you know, I'm gonna get off off the couch today, and I'm gonna seize the day and do that one thing I've never had the courage to do. Well, CPM, carpe diem. What was your moment to seize the day? <laughs> well, considering I, I saw this this morning, you know, I was saying to myself, I've got to hop on this podcast and and have the best conversation I've ever had with Corey and for all our listeners. Aww, so Aww. You, see what, you see what he <laughs> sacrificed you. Sacrifice you. <laughs> Love it. So now that we understand the many factors that go into the humanizing of data, we want to shift our focus more towards what enterprises and data scientists can learn from ignoring the need to humanize their data and gain from taking advantage of this movement. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk today about a couple of different things. And at first, we're going to focus on uh, a piece we recently read, Don't Just Digitize, Humanize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the, at the beginning of the article, they mentioned that they ran a survey in 2016 on uh, 3,500 consumers. And they were digital leaders uh, you know, within the market. And many of them scored very high um, in terms of providing functional benefits and value to their customers, such as saving time, making life just generally easier, or you know, customizing something that they weren't able to customize before. Yes, and as we focused on last week with being able to humanize data, an emotional connection matters. The bond between a consumer and the brand drives preference and loyalty. So if you can't win over someone uh, you know, with efficiency, then you're going to be winning someone over with the emotional factor. And why is that, CPM? Yeah, well, you know, as we are uh, gaining more data and learning how to use this data better and more efficiently, um, you know, it could be the case that, you know, these differentiating factors of saving time, effort, money, they end up not being differentiating factors. Everyone's sort of a robot now and able to interpret data very quickly and easily, but there's a lack of a robot having an emotional connection. So now the differentiating factor is establishing that emotional connection on top of the functional value and what that provides and, and, and how do we do it. 
Yeah, I mean, despite what what movies will tell you, robots don't have feelings, and data <laughs> doesn't doesn't have empathy. So having that kind of human connection connection drives lasting value, and mm -hmm. it's kind of exactly what technology is supposed to deliver. Yeah. So at this point, um, you know, the article sort of mentioned a couple of ways of of how do we do that. You know, what are these emotional things that you know technology can tap into? Um, and uh, they were, you know, about building the customer experience. Um, a lot of them were related to fundamental human needs that we think technology can provide in a way. Um, so, for example, it's uh, uh, understanding or taking care of, of a human being or feeling like the human being is contributing to the greater good. Um, maybe immersing them in a, a world that they've never been able to tap into or making them have a, a sense of belonging. And all of those types of emotional responses um, to using a tool or using technology will tap into that aspect that you know, we have not necessarily humanized before. That's interesting. Do you have any, any examples that you could speak to? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I think an easy one is retail, right? We all know Amazon. Um, Amazon is really good at the understanding. And, and how does it do that? Well, when you buy one product, it already can recommend to you 100 other products that you might need or you might be interested in. Um, but there's also another layer to that. You know, how about with biometrics data? What if you uh, are wearing a uh, biometric tracker and you're really sad one day, um, but then it's connected to your speaker and your speaker, you know, plays a song that's going to cheer you up um, and it's based upon your mood. Um, that's really tapping into the understanding how I feel um, and, uh, you know, taking care of, of the human. Um, there's another one I really like. Uh, I use Waze, an app for uh, navigation uh, when you're driving on the road. Um, and this one helps tap into letting you contribute or feeling like you are part of the greater good um, because uh, you are crowdsourcing traffic information. And maybe if somebody else across the way is stuck in a traffic jam, um, you're gonna be rerouted. Um, and uh, you know that you are contributing to giving data uh, to uh, this app and that's going to optimize how everybody drives. And you know, there's an emotional connection there feeling like you're a, a piece of a whole. Yeah, absolutely. You're not just getting directions from an AI, from just like a GPS. Uh, with a robot voice, you're getting human beings that are actively reporting data to you in real time. You're getting that human connection. You're establishing that uh, crowdsourcing factor where people feel motivated to help other people. Mm -hmm. So these are all gains, right? But uh, Corey, I think you you had a really good idea earlier about like what are the losses of of doing this type of uh, emotional connection building and humanizing data? Yeah, sorry to, to put a dark cloud over this, but there oh, is no. a concern. <laughs> yeah, there is a concern legitimately, and that is data privacy. You know, we're mm -hmm. not going to focus too heavily on data privacy because if you subscribe to the Banana Data podcast last season, we did an episode on conscious data disclosure and AI consumption. So you could definitely listen there for a more in-depth conversation, but we'll definitely touch on it now. So there's obviously a legitimate issue with uh, people or organizations collecting their data and then using it maybe with your consent without really realizing where your consent are. Like, do people mm -hmm. actually read the terms of service? I'm not really sure. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, if we look at a, a recent example with a Apple's most recent iOS update, they're now actively allowing you to determine whether or not in apps like Facebook, for example, if they will allow them to be able to track the data. So mm -hmm. obviously I'm concerned about data privacy, even though I live in a one bedroom apartment with three different Amazon Echoes, but still <laughs> with all that said, it's important, like who's listening, who's collecting, what's it being used for? Are you being mm -hmm. manipulated into mm -hmm. accessing certain content, making certain purchases, getting those recommendations? So I think that's definitely a loss when it comes to this. Yes, um, you know, so absolutely. Those are all valid concerns that may cross the mind of a consumer when they're using this type of technology. Um, so it's it's kind of like a, 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 a an ever flowing feedback loop, a cycle that um, we sort of need to understand. Um, because what's going to give a consumer the um, ability to want to give up that kind of data? And I think it relies upon the concept of trust. 
right? As, as companies and, and organizations want to collect this type of data to optimize their processes, to provide more functional value, and also tap into these emotional connections that then um, you know, tap into those human needs that then can provide even more value. They have to have that very personal data, that personal understanding. So um, there's this feedback loop of gaining that trust of the consumer so that the consumer would then provide that data. And then of course, you know, the, the, the company can provide more value. Again, it goes back to the uh, human connection. It goes back to the emotional mm -hmm. connection that we mentioned before. And then a loss from that obviously is if from an enterprise level, if your business isn't being able to utilize this, if it's not learning, it's losing. It's legitimately mm -hmm. losing money. If you're not being able to take the data and reinvest it back into uh, that emotional connection, then you're not understanding why your customers, consumers, users, et cetera, are even utilizing the product. And there's no way to be able to, you know, effectively even monetize that after all, an enterprise, if you're a business, if you're not, if you're losing out on opportunities to make money, then you're not really, you know, doing what your mission, vision, and goals are. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, uh, you know, you'll be dropped like a hot potato. <laughs> Ouch. Scorching. <laughs> so I, I want to talk about another point, CPM, if that's all right with you. Yeah, for sure. So I want to talk about a concept. Um, it's called creative intelligence. And mm. as a as a humanities major in college, this really prides me to say this. Data science isn't just science, it's art. <sighs> I love it. Yes. <laughs> yes, I completely a million percent agree with that. Um, you know, in previous uh, episodes and seasons, we we certainly tapped into this topic um, where there's so much that you could do objectively. But uh, whether it's um, the way in which you clean your data, the way in which you visualize your data, the way you even interpret your data sometimes, there's a lot of subjectivity. Um, and of course, you know, uh, we've, all, we've always talked about responsible AI and topics of that nature, which this very much plays into um, that subjectivity concept. Absolutely. I kind of want to focus on this point for a little bit, though. It's like, okay. can you kind of bring us through, like, in your opinion or your knowledge, you're a very smart person, like... <laughs> What is the differentiation between science and art here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you again for the compliment. <laughs> Corey, you are also um, the, the yin to my yang. <laughs> I would be nothing without you. Um, but yeah, for, for this balance between science and art and data science, um, you know, uh, science, uh, when I think of it in the data science framework, is very much about experimentation. You know, if I change this widget on my website, am I going to get more clicks? Or um, if I plant this plant in soil that is fertilized, is it going to grow more? It's all about this systematic study of either behavior of human beings or um, the behavior of manifestations in the real world um, through observation and experimentation. And, you know, think about a scientist in a lab. It's very rigorous. It's very objective. This happens and this is the result or this happens and something else happens. On the other hand, art is all about expression. It's all about uh, you know, blending things together and interpreting things in new ways. Um, and I think most of art is about creative skill and creativity really stems from a human being. So CPM, do you think there needs to be a, a balance between art and science here? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, this balance between art and science, um, it's really critical uh, to, you know, sort of the success of, of any sort of data science project, or even as we talked about before, how technology can really bridge the gap between um, being robots and, and, and humanizing. Um, we have so much data, but all of that data is about people. And so, you know, if we are just sticking to science, um, it's going to be very obdurate and very rigid. Um, but having this human element and this creative element to the science will, again, make us more likely to have more of a human connection and an emotional connection to whoever's consuming that data. Yeah, we're going to put our thinking caps on for a second because okay. I want to boop boop. Uh, Engaging. I want to be able to, yeah, engage with this kind of idea. Like, you know, we go back to this emotional connection again. We could use machine learning. We could use 
business intelligence, we could use AI, we could use a bunch of things to kind of try to uh, incentivize people to make a decision, but we're emotional animals. We make decisions every day based on emotion. And then we rationalize and justify them at a later point. You know, while yeah. business intelligence is critical, while artificial intelligence is, you know, awe-inspiring, there's an argument that, you know, creative intelligence, what we've just been discussing, mm -hmm. leads to kind of a way to optimize the considered purchase. It's again, back to that balance. Like, are we, how do you merge or how do you use the science to try to promote the art? How do you use this technology to help uh, build an emotional connection? Yeah. You know, an, an example I think might help here. Um, you know, the article talks about uh, the considering buying a home. You know, that's yeah. a really huge decision. It's totally different than, you know, uh, buying dog food from Amazon or, you know, buying, you know, hand cream or something like that. That's, you know, a small purchase. But when you buy a home, uh, there's definitely financial implications to that. Yeah. Um, but there's also a personal connection mm. to buying a home, you know, starting a new family, or maybe you're relocating and you're, uh, you're starting a new life. Um, data is going to tell you, you know, how many times a, a person clicks on a website and views a different listing for a house or um, what keywords are associated with what they're searching in the search bar, um, you know, correlations between their activities, um, which is a lot of valuable information, of course. Um, but the art and, 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 and how somebody might look at the way in which they click on the website or navigate through um, or even their background information and, and you know, you know, where they've been in life and what, what they might be doing, um, that's a more human element that sometimes um, may get put by the wayside or not necessarily be focused on as much as the sort of tangible clicks and, 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 and links and words that they're typing into the search bar. Leveraging that human element, um, if you're able to sort of put yourself into the consumer's shoes and really understand their emotional connection to the decision they're about to make and um, what it's like to be a home buyer about to start a new family um, and so on and so forth, those considerations are going to drive a connection between the science and the art that ultimately creates a better model, a better prediction, and, and a better sort of experience for the human being. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, with your example of purchasing a home, you know, if you have to make mortgage payments and you have to pay it off within 10 <laughs> to 30 years, I certainly hope there is an emotional connection because, uh, you know, why would you be making that sort of investment yet? And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think realtors, I think home, you know, I think construction companies, I think, you know, people that are utilizing this data certainly understand that emotional aspect when they're able to try to appeal these opportunities to purchase a home either for the first time or relocate and have a brand new life experience, start a family and upgrade your living situation. They could use the data to kind of help segment these types of audiences, but certainly make that emotional appeal and connection when actually purchasing the homes. Because after all, humans are gonna make emotional decisions and that's what, mm -hmm. the, what they have to sort of touch on. Yeah, you know, most decisions, and you might argue that, that all decisions are made based upon an emotional sort of feeling. And, you know, we can rack, uh, we can, uh, you know, rationalize these with data, but also, you know, the, the reason is an emotional, you know, push. Speaking of emotions and human beings, you know, we at the Banana Data Podcast, we want to put our money where our mouth is. So mm -hmm. we've been talking about data humanization. So we're going to practice what we preach. And next week, we're actually going to have a live human being guest that's going to oh join gosh. us. Yes. Oh, that's exciting. And so CPM, do you want to tell yeah. everyone what next week's episode is about? Yeah, sure. Um, so our next episode is going to be about the rise of the citizen data scientist. So we're going to chat about how to distill data and how to simplify data and translate it to the right stakeholders. Um, you know, we'll ask questions like, how do you deliver the right sort of value to both technical and non-technical audiences? So we'll continue with this conversation about humanizing data. And this podcast is nothing without its human supporters. So just one last plug to subscribe to the Banana Data Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. I can't wait. That's all we've got today in the world of Banana Data. We'll be back with another podcast in two weeks. In the meantime, the Banana Data Podcast is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. See you next time.